Hi everyone, thank you for joining Mindshare Matters. I can't wait for you to meet Larry Gilbert, my good friend who shares my amazing haircut, but more importantly, is an incredible entrepreneur who's built one of the most successful gift shop operators in the country. I can't wait for you to hear Larry's story and his connection to the movie, The Titanic. Please enjoy. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining me again for Mindshare Matters. I can't wait to uh, share with you my good friend Larry Gilbert and the conversation uh, today with him. And let's just get right to it. Larry, good morning and thanks so much for joining me in our new office. Well, it's beautiful. I no. love your new office. Thanks for having me. No, it's great to so be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, I think this is more bald than uh, anyone's used to on a, on a single screen. So hopefully we go back and yeah, forth between be. cameras. Let's not capture too much at the same time and the glare isn't too bad. <laughs> so Larry, I always love to start from the complete beginning, like where you were born and what the circumstances of your growing up were like. So I'd love to hear where you were born and what that was like. Well, I'm um, born in, in Texas, but my early days were in Oregon, all the way up through high school in um, Beaverton, Oregon, oh. and uh, went to Beaverton High School and grew up in a pretty, pretty traditional suburban uh, high school world, um, and good family and friends. You know, it's kind of a lot of, of, uh, of you know, uh, sports and friends and close family and my parents uh, I, I was a Brady kid I guess my mom married my best friend's dad when I was in junior wow. high school so our families came together and um, he was my my stepdad who was my uh, baseball coach uh, and my mom. You knew him as your baseball coach yeah. before he became your stepdad. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So he was he was uh, he was Coach Jack, and um, yeah, Corey and I played baseball together, and and uh, were Spanish class uh, buddies, and and just kind of goofing around, and ended up uh, growing up through high school together, and then my brother and. Uh, my stepdad's younger daughter were the same age too, and so, so we ended up coming together as as uh, as a family. And then, when I graduated, I left and moved to San Diego to go to college. I decided a change of scenery would be uh, would be a good thing, and I want to stay on the West Coast. And I didn't have any plan, so I just went as far south as I could get, and I kind of hit the border. <laughs> and turn around and and uh, and found uh, found UCSD and and loved going to school in San Diego, and uh, and ended up like everybody who leaves Oregon and goes to school in San Diego ended up staying there because why why wouldn't you? <laughs> and started my started my career there and uh, and that's that's really where we settled and raised our family. That's an amazing, I had no idea. I had no idea about the Brady component. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. And where were you in the board, uh, not birth order, but uh, in terms of age? I'm the oldest. You're the oldest. Uh, a little bit older than my stepbrother. But yeah, we were basically, basically the same. And in high school, what were you thinking your future would be in college and beyond? I always, I mean, I don't know how far ahead I played it, to be honest with you. I, I think it was in a one hill at a time, really. I mean, it was like, let's, let's, let's leave the small town. It was sort of the cliche, like, let's, let's, let's get out and let's, let's see what else is out there. I, I, but I was, I would say, curious and entrepreneurial. I mean, we had, my stepbrother and I had so many knucklehead businesses that we were doing everything from painting no addresses on curbs for money to cleaning out people's gutters because Mount St. Helens erupted when I was growing up. And every time it rained, all the ash would come down and fill up people's gutters. And so we'd charge people money to go around and scrape the ash out of their gutters. And this all. is in high school. 
Yeah. On your yeah. own, self-motivated. Do do yeah. So we were always trying to come up with knucklehead ways to make money. And um, so I think that, that Gen, Gen Z call that hustling. It's not, <laughs> you call it knucklehead. We call it hustling. Now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know if they were even side hustles because we were pretty obsessed with like the idea of trying to figure stuff out that might work. But um, that's awesome. So, so yeah, I think, I mean, I think fairly early on, I had a sense that I would want to start a business. I don't know if I knew how unemployable I was. I mean, I think I discovered that when I got a job and realized that that probably wasn't going to be a sustainable path for me. Uh, but yeah, I think I had a sense. And what did you study? What did you decide to study in college? I studied, it was called quantitative economics because UCSD, I didn't do okay, any. You didn't pick something easy then. Well, no, I picked the only up. thing that seemed like it might relate to business mm -hmm. because I, I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't do any, I didn't know what was available at UCSD. I just wanted to go to school in San Diego. And they had no business school. I mean, now there's a management business school, but back, and they, didn't, they don't have anything that's even back then that was business related. So it was, it was all science and engineering. So this was a lot of regression analysis and pivot tables and all things that I have never looked at since leaving college. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it just was as, as near as I could approximate to what I thought I wanted to do. So you moved from, from Oregon to San Diego, the southern tip of the U.S. on the west coast. Yep. You graduate from UCSD in a very quantitative technical field. And what do you do? What do you do after that? Um, well, like any common sense movie, go live in Japan for a while. So I, I went to, um, I had studied a little bit in uh, Japan. My dad took me on a trip with him when I was in, uh, a sophomore, and I fell in love with the culture. So the UCSD did offer Japanese language. Um, and so I studied. And then I ended up getting a job at the American Embassy as sort of, sort of a hybrid job internship in the Agriculture Trade Office. I walked in, I knew I, I had met a family that I was able to live with, and that's a whole rabbit hole. But in doing that, they, Mama San invited me to come and stay with her, and she said, you know, just you gotta find a job or whatever you can do. So, um, like any, I guess, I mean, sort of a common sense thought that the American embassy must hire Americans. So mm -hmm. went into Tokyo and back then you could kind of walk into the embassy. And so I walked up to the front counter and I said, I, I, I'm an American, I have a place to live. Is there a way I could work here? <laughs> and the lady, and the was like, yeah, you know, we have a state department and yeah. like, no, you can't. <laughs> and so while I'm having this little exchange, a woman walks up behind me and I mean, in, in, in a very kind of commanding presence, Suzanne Hale. And Suzanne's just amused by this whole exchange. And she's like, look, you, you can't uh, be hired, as she's telling you, but I can give you an internship and a little bit of money um, if you want to come and help us out with our trade fairs. That's what the Agriculture Trade Office did. And my primary job was uh, marketing or helping market Jelly Bellies the little jelly beans, because back then, remember President Reagan was all into uh, jelly bellies, and so that was the, the, <laughs> the hot thing that we were trying to get into the Japanese marketplace. But she said, Suzanne said, the way to make money really is you go into the postal exchange, where you, the, the American place where you can buy groceries, and she said you buy Eggo waffles and, and you buy Pop-Tarts, and you trade those for drinks with the bond traders in Rapungi. Because those guys will give you, they're the, they're the guys with all the money. So they will pay for your lifestyle if you just bring them American uh, snack food and, and breakfast treats. So that was how I survived. So you're hustling even working, <laughs> working, working at the embassy. I guess so. That was a side hustle in fairness. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, but please, you referenced Mama San. Mm -hmm. So that was before this particular visit, or did that happen? That happened, so... Um, so the, the, I'll, I'll, I'll make this story small. When I first went over there to live or to study, um, it was in the fall, and uh, winter was coming, and one of the guys I was studying was said, uh, we got to climb Mount Fuji before the winter comes. 
yeah, we should. We'll go climb Mount Fuji. That sounds great. So we didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. So we, we, we hopped on the train. Neither of us had the common sense to bring cash. So we assumed that we create a credit card and we'd find, you know, and we had support from our loving parents. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so we get out to where Mount Fuji is and nobody's taking our credit cards and it's getting cold at night and, and we're hungry. So in one of my less proud moments, we, um, we visited a 7-Eleven for some snack food. Um, <laughs> and, Even in Japan. <laughs> and we, um, we, we, we had to, uh, we had to, we had to fend for ourselves in a creative way. We stayed in the back of a hotel bus for the night and um, ended up with enough sustenance and enough warmth to get up and back down Mount Fuji. And we get back to the train station where the school was. And we're walking back about a, a, a few blocks back to the school. And we're starving. I mean, we'd eaten M&Ms, basically. And, um, and I said, there's a coffee shop with a light on. And the, my buddy's like, I, go ahead. I'm going to bed. I said, I'm going to go in there and just. So I walk in, and I start trying to explain in my little bit of Japanese to what Mama-san what's going on, and can I just have a snack, and I can pay you tomorrow. I don't have any cash right now, but I just go to school right there. And, and she just starts laughing. She's just looking at me, and all she's doing is laughing. And she ends up, start, she brings out steak and sushi, and, she's bringing, and, I'm, and I'm terrified. I'm like, oh my God, she's bringing me all this stuff, and I don't, have any, I don't have any money, and this is awful. <laughs> and now she's bringing me beers, and, all, you know, and, I'm just, and, and there's a woman in the corner, and she is dying laughing, and she's watching this whole exchange. So we're into this thing, and I'm just, just nervous. And like, this is going to be an international incident, right? And after a, a bit of trying to fight out conversation with Mama Son, this woman walks over and she says, "Hi, I'm, um, I'm Mrs. Fleming. How can I help you?" <laughs> and, and she had married an American and spoke was perfectly bilingual. So she ends up translating for us into the wee hours of the night. And Mama Son is um, getting ready to leave. She said. Um, you got to pack your stuff up and come live here. She said, you're not going to learn anything about Japanese culture living over at the school with all those American kids. So, so I, and next day, I just moved into her, uh, up into her loft, and she's been one of my dearest friends ever since. She came to our wedding in full, the only time she ever got on an airplane. When Rachel and I got married, she and Papa Sung came over and wore kimono, and uh, it was really special. Anyone hearing this now could tell from your story in your 20s that you were going to do special things. I mean, you go to Japan, you walk into the embassy and say, I want a job. You, uh, you uh, walk into a cafe at night, not speaking Japanese with no money and make it happen. I mean, it's, it's amazing. You, you just saw that as, that's just normal. You just figure it out. I don't know, some may say questionable judgment, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's to nice. To be an you, entrepreneur, nice you, you have say. to be a little crazy, <laughs> just a little crazy. <laughs> so how, how does the Japan trip end? How do, you, uh, how do you end that chapter? Well, that's the segue to what was my first job. Um, I ended up leaving Japan and getting hired by the Price Club. Then before Costco, wow. the, there was the Price Club. And um, Fasal had started the Warehouse Club format. And he was looking for someone to help leverage their buying power and sell product in bulk in Asia. And at the time, Japan was the obvious starting place. So I got that job. And that's a whole other thing. but. Um, Another Larry story. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it, another one of those. It, you it, walked it, in and just got was, the job. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, the woman who hired me, we're still partners. Um, wow. Which is a, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great, great, great story. But um, I got that job, and I didn't know anything about business. I mean, I didn't know anything about anything relating to, uh, I mean, we're, we're working with purchase orders and invoices and vendor. I mean, I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't study any of it, right? So I'm just completely bewildered. Um, but it ended up that the Price Club, uh, so we, d because of all of their resources, it was hard to fail, really. I mean, they were, they were so well regarded in, in Japan and in Asia. So I was just putting through my limited network, putting 
the idea out there, and we were getting a positive response. Visitors were coming. So we'd walk them through Price Club, and they'd be excited, and we'd start placing orders for everything from T-shirts to golf balls to, I mean, we were exporting all kinds of stuff. Um, so it ended up becoming uh, a business that we built inside a Price Club, and that was several years, and then Costco showed up, and they, had, they already had an international uh, framework, I guess, and so they didn't need us. So that was when I got uh, and offered the opportunity to go and become an entrepreneur. <laughs> Might be a nice way to say it. <laughs> but that was your foray into retail. And, and did you pick retail? Like, how are you? Well, I never learned retail. I mean, honestly, when I started Event Network, I didn't know anything about retail. Hmm. So there was the there was the thought of retail. Yeah. Because I was working for a retailer, but I never learned anything about retail. So I was just the trading guy who was you know, facilitating these relationships. But how retail really works, no. I have no idea. And during, so after leaving Price Club, kind of fell into a phase of serial entrepreneurship. So then we started a microbrewery, uh, or there was a microbrewery that a cousin of cousin had started and invited me into in the formative stages, and we had a, a retail business that wasn't really retail; it was more of an access to product business because some vendors like you to have retail to sell you things. So again, it was retail, but not mm. really. So, and and none of these, and we kept exporting also. And none of these businesses were really doing much in the way of actually making money. We were mostly sort of trading money around and, and trying to keep things moving along. But, um, but during this period, it was kind of on the tail end of the, the, the brewery met a spectacular ending. <laughs> we, were, we had a, a, a beer called Lemon Lager, which was a shandy, like a lemon beer wow, mixture. Yeah. And, so you're putting lemon juice into beer, which is sugar, and then you're putting a cap on it. We shipped a bunch to San Diego. We shipped it to a supermarket on a hot day, and it was blowing up in the store. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we got a call from the store manager like, you better get your beer out of here because someone's going to get hurt by your beer. Wow. <laughs> so, we, so that was really the end of the brewery, <laughs> among other reasons. But so during all of that, a friend came to me and he said, um, I know these guys who are recovering the Titanic. And they're working on having an exhibit in Boston and um, you sort of have retail experience. They want someone to run a gift shop for them for the Titanic exhibit. And um, he said, I mean, he said, I, he, he knew me well enough to know I don't really have retail experience, but he said, I, I think you could, you I think there's a out. story there. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so we ended up going to New York, which is where they were based. Was, the company was RMS Titanic Incorporated. And these were guys who had, uh, I guess, I mean, somehow controlled the wreck of the ship from, it started with Bob Ballard. And so they had, through maritime courts, uh, received the rights to, uh, to recover the artifacts. And so... We made a deal with them, and we opened a, about a 3,000 square foot Titanic store in a tent in Boston. Uh, and uh, it was on July 1st, 1998, and we had to basically took all the money from all these other things we were doing and just started buying Titanic Good. stuff. And we had everything from dishes to jewelry. Rep we replicated things that were recovered from the ship. Uh, like the White Star Lines, China, things that wow. some of it was still being made. We found the company that was making the soap. <laughs> we had furniture. I mean, it was, it was, thinking back now, I mean, it was nuts. I mean, we had no, no, no reason to think any, or shouldn't have had any reason to think anybody was going to buy any of this. And then the movie happened. And you didn't know and about So, the I mean, well, we knew there was going to be a movie, but, but, I mean, that it was going to become the wow. spectacular phenomenon that so um, so I, I mean if it's not for Leonardo and, and, and Kate 
we're not sitting here. At least we're talking about something, something else, else for sure. Hundred <laughs> um, percent. So we, in spite of knowing nothing, having a, a mess of inventory, and I mean, no real uh, controls or processes or any of those retail things. I mean, we didn't have any of it. Uh, but people were buying everything that said Titanic on it, and we had a lot of Leo stuff because so one like the best selling item somebody had bought an original cut of the movie and they, they cut the film into individual little uh, like film cells and they put it in acrylic. So kids would sit on the, on the floor in the store and spread these out and then they'd find the, sh the money shot of Leonardo DiCaprio and they'd, they'd get the one they wanted. And wow. so it, it was, I mean, it really was uh, just for a while, they're just insane. But so at the end of the first run, um, the show, we weren't sure the show was going to go on, but it went to St. Paul, Minnesota, to an old train station. So we had a cardboard cutout of Leo. So we put him on the front of a U-Haul, put all the inventory in the back of a truck, and we drove to Minnesota. And um, Rachel was our first store manager. She and I lived in Boston for the run of it. This was before marriage? <laughs> We're married You're before married children. Now, before uh, children. Children okay. are now just starting to come along. Um, and so we go to Minnesota, and, but the show started to find its way. Clear Channel Communications bought the rights to the show, invested heavily in it, and started placing it in museums. So that's how Event Network became a cultural attraction retail operator, 100% by accident. It was, we're in these museums, we're doing the Titanic show, and, and I'm wondering why, you know, why do they run their gift shops? I mean, it was sort of a blinding flash of the obvious, like, you know, I, I, you know, I don't want to run a museum. Why do they want to run a store kind of thing? <laughs> and not that we knew what we were doing. It's sort of like we're, we suck less, maybe, you know, <laughs> like, you know, it's like that kind of idea. And uh, so we found our way into a couple museums early on. And the, that's how the cultural attraction business was seeded and developed. Was it called Event Network back then? Or? It was called Titanic Merchandising, and then at the end of that first year, we called it Event Network because what we thought was we were going to be an event production business. So we thought we would be in the, because in the, we were enamored with the idea of bundling events and retail, I and see. we thought there must be other ones, and, and that was kind of a naive assumption. Titanic was very unique. I mean, the movie rocket fueled it for sure, and we have done a lot of other exhibits for like Lucasfilm and Disney and all that, but um, that have done well. I mean, and then many more science-y type ones uh, over the years. But, uh, but Titanic was really a good place to start, and we just had no idea when it all began that it was that unique as, a, as, a, as an exhibit model. Amazing, amazing. Um, let's please fast forward to now, and then we're going to go back again. But Please give us an idea of, um, and let's let's ignore let's ignore the obvious COVID for a while, you know, uh, and and the impact COVID had on retail in general. Um, uh, at at its peak, what did Event Network reach in terms of scale? Whatever you are comfortable sharing. Uh, well, at its uh, we well, about about a hundred partnerships. Wow. I mean, and its peak would be as far as partnerships, just pre-COVID. Yeah. Uh, so, about, yeah, about a year ago, March. Um, about 1,200 employees. Wow, 1,200 people mm -hmm. and 100 partnerships. Are... And, and we call each location a partnership. So, Got it. So a, a museum or a zoo may have multiple stores, but we look at an individual location or as, as a partnership. And are, are, are each, do you see each location as a mimicked version of other locations, or are they really almost standalone separate businesses since I'm assuming the inventory would be specific to the partnership? Yeah, and we, we are operationally at our core a chain of dissimilar stores. So that's really the operating kernel that is the company is an ability to make sure that each one is bespoke and unique and unto itself. Because we, we view our purpose as to take an experience and then extend it in a retail environment. So the items, the presentation, the stories we're telling in the store, they all have to be unique to the location in order for 
in order for us to serve our partners and in order for the business to, to be successful. So the systems, the inventory, the, the, the vendors, the relationships, all that are scaled to be different at each spot. It's amazing to me. You go from the Titanic store in 1998 to 20 or so years later, 1,200 employees, 100 partnerships. That, that, the, the scale in 20 years is, is phenomenal. And let's revisit COVID because you know, we knew each other quite deeply during the COVID experience, and we could cover that in a second. But in that 20 or so year span, could you mention the highlight moment and the low light moment? Because I think the presumption is entrepreneurs like you come from a very, everything was planned, everything was systematic. You knew at 15 you were going to be an entrepreneur and you knew what kind of business. And I think your story shows it's all but that. Um, but yeah. Well, as you say that, I mean, I think, I mean, the, the, I guess maybe I can share the sort of the seminal inflection moment because that was, you know, that's kind of the, which is really both at the same time. Mm. Um, so we had, Titanic was moving along. We were a couple years in, um, in 2000. Uh, we had opened a couple science museums. My brother joined the company as our business development uh, leader, partner. And um, we were having conversations with some uh, you know, large organizations, zoos and aquariums, and things that our instincts were, were like, hmm, this is gonna be a game changer. Like, yeah, yeah. But meanwhile, Titanic now has been going a while. It's kind of, Leo's kind of fading a little bit. Um, and we had started with these museums and we made kind of bad deals. Mm -hmm. Like, we'll buy all your inventory, we'll hire all your people. So basically, you just transfer all your problems and all your costs <laughs> onto us. Sounds like a great <laughs> and, You know, they're like, sure, I mean, really? And I'm like, yeah, you know, we'll do that. And, we, and so we started with that framework, so our cash was going quickly. And so into 2001, we're watching our cash go away. We formed a little tiny relationship with the uh, bank in Coronado, California. It was just a little regional bank. Give us, it wasn't really a loan. It was, we'll give you some money, but you got to pledge everything. And as soon as we want it back, you're going to give it to us. So bought us a little time. But we're into September 2001. And um, the... Association of Zoos and Aquariums was having their annual conference in St. Louis. And we had the store at the St. Louis Science Center. So that was, our, that was kind of our flagship at the time. So we're operating in the, in the Science Museum. We'd spent some money and we invited the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago, which is a big aquarium, and a zoo in Indianapolis and a zoo in Cincinnati. They were the three that were really in. We said, well, we'll have a cocktail party in our store and we'll treat you and we'll show off our, our We'll show off our business, and you guys will love us, and, and then you'll hire us, and that'll save our company, because we're increasingly convinced that something had to happen. And so on September 9th, we had the cocktail party, and they patted us nicely on the head and said, yeah, but no, <laughs> you guys aren't, you're not big enough. You're not, I mean, we're bigger than these little science museums, and so. So on September 10th, Rachel, uh, Kayla, our daughter was two at the time, and Ryan was a newborn. We flew to New York City um, on the 10th. And um, so we landed, beautiful sunny day. And I have a memory of Kayla sitting on my lap. We're in the cab going to our hotel in Midtown. And I'm pointing at the World Trade Center to Kayla, you know, like any knucklehead dad, like, look, two-year-old daughter who could care less. <laughs> but I, clear, you know, crystal clear image in my mind of the Twin Towers, and, wow. um, and so this is a hard story for me to tell, so I may not get all the way through it. But So we get to, uh, get to the hotel, and the reason we went to New York was because the United States Golf Association was planning uh, an exhibit of golf stuff, and we thought it might be worth checking out, and they wanted a retail partner. So on September 11th, um, got up early, and I was actually underneath the towers getting out of the path train to go down to New Jersey at about 8.30. Um, so riding down on the train, and about 8.45, called uh, 
tried to call Rachel to just to check in, and of course the phones aren't working. And I got to the train station, um, and uh, it, it, it was Far Hills, I think. And um, the guy from the golf house wasn't there. And I was, that's kind of weird. And so I uh, called him from the payphone, and he did answer. And he said, oh, you have no idea what's going on, do you? And I said, oh, what's going on? He said, don't move. And so he came and picked me up. And I could actually see smoke in lower Manhattan. And so I called Rachel from his office, and sh she didn't know. It was, she was you know, still waking up and all that. And I said, um, order all the room service you can, because I, I believe the United States is at war. I, we don't, I don't know what's going on. And just turn on the TV and just, just you know, lock yourself in the hotel room. And the golf house people found me somewhere to stay that night. And the, the train started running up the east side the next day. And we got back to got back to the hotel. We got a flight out of Albany that next weekend, and got back to San Diego. And the Monday morning, the first phone call was from the bank at Coronado, and they said, uh, "Look." Um, you know, world's changed. Nobody's going to go to these little places you're operating. So we want all your money, uh, like now. And um, so, you know, that was really the, it, that moment was the end of the business. Because we were, I mean, we were out of cash. You really believed it was the end? We were out of cash. I mean, there was no, and, and without their support, there was no, and we, without these, these opportunities that would have been Game changers, uh, at least we thought, um, going forward was nuts. Wow. And so, so I went home and uh, walked in and ra sat down with Rach and I said, look, you know, we got to stop. I mean, we got two little kids and we didn't have a lot. We had a little house and, you know, it's like, we got to stop. And she said, without batting an eye, and this is the part I can't ever get through. She said, look, um, she's <laughs> she said, Event Network will be a great company someday. Do what you have to do. And I said, Rach, you know, um, it can be bad. I mean, you know, bankruptcy is bad and this is going on. I mean, we're not a big company, but we've made sort of a mess of this thing. And um, it's, it's going to be rough. And um, she said, I don't, I don't care. You got, you, you got to see it through. You just have to see it through. She said, you'll regret not and you'll regret not more than if it doesn't work and the clarity and the conviction was maybe so stunning that i against all of my better judgment we applied for over 50 credit cards <laughs> the next wow. day and um and maxed them all out and we made payroll and um put out a couple fires and then in the, in the weeks that followed, those two zoos and the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago, which really, as you say, what's the high point? The phone rang, and um, we learned that we had the, the CFO of the Shedd Aquarium said, I, I know this is a mistake, because <laughs> I know you guys aren't ready, but I also know you'll figure it out. And, and she said, so January 1st, we began the transition to all three of those. And we weren't able to make bad deals because we have any money. <laughs> so we said, if you want us to do this, you have to just you know, let us just figure it out as we go. And so it ended up being an opportunity to keep, keep going. And, um, and you know, to this day, our relationship with the Shed Aquarium is the one that we hold the most dear. And, and the CFO is, you know, there's there's those handful of people, right? That you know, you say who who are those people that change? You know, Mama Son, and I mean, there's these that really changed everything. And um, Joyce Simon's her name, um, for sure. In 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 with that phone call, changed changed all of it. Larry, honestly, hearing hearing this story mm -hmm. every time, but now with with COVID in our somewhat rearview mirror, as as I know for your business. I wonder if this may have been even a more seminal moment than what you went through with COVID, or do you feel like the COVID experience was uh, 
was even more material. Well, yeah, it's it the 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 impact of co the the I think that with with the 9/11 experience there wasn't as much breadth and depth to kind of collapse upon maybe I'm just thinking out loud but but when when things began shutting down due to covid it was i mean it was it was to zero stunningly quickly and once things started to close and there was so much more infrastructure to to try to make sense out of um, so you seeing a way through that um, it was it was I guess a, in a similar way a kind of a survival moment and this one was with radically more complexity. Um, there were so many more stakeholders, there were so many more moving parts, um, and most profoundly, the impact on our people was uh, unimaginable. I mean, and, not, you know, and, 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 and painful beyond anything I've ever experienced professionally, because there were so many that, that we knew were going to be impacted. Um, and the beauty of the response. So, you know, the where the, you know, just again, sort of thinking out loud and, and, and sharing this, uh, this idea for the first time, it, the beauty of the after 9-11 moment was all people. And the beauty of the COVID impact and the and the immediacy and what all that had to happen, it, it was all people and in, in a way that was beautiful beyond any capacity for me to imagine. Um, the sharing, the collaboration, the generosity, the willingness to do whatever was necessary to find a way forward, uh, to sacrifice, to sh I mean, to share to share sacrifice, not just financially, but what do we have to do? And how do we have to do it together? And how do we have to do it different? Was, um, I mean, we've said over and over in these last several months as things have kind of transitioned back to opening. Um, I mean, it's a story we never could have imagined um, in all of it, both you know, the, the pain and the beauty of it. I remember our conversations almost exactly a year ago today, um, would you have envisioned today a year ago? No way. No way. No way. I mean, I, 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 I never let myself imagine that the company wouldn't have survived in some capacity, but that it is thriving in its new, uh, in its new uh, kind of rebuilt manifestation or whatever the right word is, I, that I could not have imagined. Um, and that it's, that it's benefiting so profoundly from so many things that we, cows that we thought had been sacred. Um, so many assumptions, so many things that while working, we were able to pull together and learn from, and, and then the ability for everyone to share. I mean, watching, like some of my proudest moments are all on the screen, but watching the ball kind of get tossed around and, 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 and the idea that, hey, you know, I'll take it, I got that. Yeah, well, let's do that. And, and, and together and selflessly, um, you know, those are the things that we, as we think about, don't waste a good crisis. That's kind of been our mantra, uh, you know, and, and, and all of it. Um, what I hope we hang on to the most is a lot of that, that, that has come out of it. Larry, I'd, I'd love for you to be as authentic as you can be as you've been throughout this whole conversation with respect to the next question. Um, 
people like you tend not to regret too much because they just f take lessons and move on. But if there were a regret, is there something you regret professionally or personally? Uh, um, my, my biggest regret is I shared that my brother joined the business in 2000 and we became partners and and growing up and 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 when we began as business partners I mean he joined because we'd always dreamed of doing something together um, and in the f first phase of it it was everything we'd hoped I mean it was just beautiful you know we, we did so much together and we laughed together and, and struggled together and solved problems together. And, and then we got to a place where we just started to grow apart. And we just didn't see things the same way. And, um, and, and it's, once we got on that path, it got hard to get off it. And then, you know, kind of water, water starts getting put under the bridge and, and, and then the family started to grow apart. And, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a profound regret, letting it get to where it's gotten. Um, and, and we're still in the business together. And we've gotten through COVID together, and he's been a huge part of all of this. Um, but, you know, I missed my nieces really growing up. Like, I didn't get to share in, in the, really in their lives, and they're, they're, and they're great girls. Um, and I, yeah, I mean, my, my biggest regret is, 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 is my relationship with Jerry. And, and my biggest dream is that we can repair it somehow. That we can find a way back to not just getting along, but, you know, like, like when, the, when the chips are down, like, I want him to be my first phone call. Like, yeah, like, like Jerry, you know, we've got to do this together. Uh, so, yeah, and that's what I, I hope we can get to. I really appreciate that. To close us out, I love this question. Um, aside from your beautiful family, what are you most proud of? Um, yeah, well, you, you, you took the one that's for sure um, that, that I would definitely go to in a moment. Um, I think it's it's close, it's real connections with, I feel like I have um, friendships and, lo and you know, lo loving relationships and the opportunity to really, um, to really be with people from all of my life, you know, and, and, and that feels, it just feels like such a great blessing to be able to you know, have have those types of relationships. Um, I mean, I'm certainly proud of on the business side um, our our relationships inside of our business and the way that um, the way that everyone looks out for one another. Like, really, really, you know, with 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 that first, it's like, yeah, we're a business and it has to be a profitable thing, and you know, of course. Um, but I think that's because of the commitment people have to wanting to just care, care a lot for one another for, and for those that we're uh, hired to work for. Thank you so much. Thanks for uh, not just making the time, but for being so authentic and for hitting on some of those points. I really appreciate your time. It's been wonderful having you here. So thank you for making the time. Thanks for having me. I love it.